Carolyn Doobie here. What's the play for today? Well, today I'm playing with the rainbow. I'm going to start out with the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And when I'm done, I'm going to have the whole rainbow happening. How is this all going to be mixed together? Well, it's going to happen when I put all the paint in a cup and then flip it over and do what's called a flip pour on a canvas. Actually, not a canvas. It's a wood panel, but you've got the idea. I want to have lots and lots of cells in this, so I'm going to give this a little extra help to make those cells. I'm going to put a drop of dimethicone in these. And when I say a drop, I mean a drop or two or three. I'm not very accurate or precise, and the cheap plastic pipette that I'm using kind of thing is not very precise either. So one, two, three drops, kind of like that. I love that it's so forgiving, I don't have to be that precise. Now, I'm using dimethicone to do this. Could you use silicone to do this too? Absolutely. Whatever you've got that you like as a cell maker, you pop that in there. Now what's in those jars, by the way? Well, that is Floetrol and acrylic paint. And how I mix that up, what the ratio is, how I go about that, those kinds of things, I've got that all for you over in a video that's everything you need to know to get started paint pouring. And yep, I'll have that linked down below for you. I found that working with the flow trawl is one of the easiest ways to get started making pours and it gives fantastic results when it comes to getting those cells. When you're mixing things together, here where I'm trying to get that dimethicone to mix all around, you want to make sure that you stir gently because you want to keep from getting any excess air in there. Because air bubbles in your paint, when you pour it out, will mean air bubbles in your pour. So why do I keep the paint in these canning jars? Well, two reasons. One, the canning jars are easy to get at the grocery store. And two, they have a lid. So that means I can mix up a big batch, use what I want, and then put the lid on it and it's ready to go next time I want to play with it. Well, let's start filling this cup with paint. I'm going to put layers of color in here. You might be wondering, if you're new to this, what are the rules for putting paint in there? Well, with paint pouring, it's not like there are a lot of rules. It's really about understanding what the paint's going to do, how it's going to behave when you flip it, that kind of thing. I like things that have a complex look, that there's lots going on, the cells, the colors, mingling, mixing, all that stuff. So to get that, what I found is I wanted to have at least six layers in the cup. Minimum of six layers would get me a good look. Anytime I went below that in my experiments, what I found is it just didn't look as interesting to me when I flipped the cup over. So what about cup size? Is there an exact cup size that you need? Well, no, not to that either. There are no exact rules here. The bigger the cup, the more paint you're going to have in it. The smaller the cup, the less paint that it holds. That's really the most important thing to know, and you've probably already got a pretty good handle on that concept. Now I'm going to be doing an 8x10 pour here, and this will be an ample amount of paint. There is going to be plenty of paint that's going to go spilling over the edges, which by the way will be caught in the box down there, and how I set that up and why I put a Teflon mat under there and that kind of thing, that's also in that everything you need to know to get started video. Because that paint that falls down to the bottom, I'm going to let that dry and it's become a beautiful, incredible paint skin that I'll peel up in a couple of days. Yeah. The paint skins, they take like a couple of days, sometimes even a week, depending on how much paint's there for them to dry after I've been playing for an afternoon and I end up with a colorful soup down there. So back to the idea of how big a cup do you need for this? What is the magical size of cup to do, say an eight by 10 pour, which is what I'm doing here. There's no magical size. I don't have an exact answer for you. What it comes down to is your preference. When you have more paint in a cup, more paint goes flowing around, you get more colors interacting. If you use less paint, you have less of the stuff. So the best thing that I can tell you is try it with a small amount, try it with more, until you find the amount that makes you happiest. The look that you go, yeah, this is the size that I want to use. It's kind of like a Goldilocks thing. Is it too much, too little, and then you find what's just right for you. For this, I want to do a flip pour. So what I'm going to do is take my wood panel that I've already primed with some gesso. And what I'm going to do is put the panel on top of the cup and flip it over. Now, before you lift the cup up, you want to make sure to say the magic words. Abracadabra always makes a pour go a little bit better. Once you're ready, you've said your magic words. You just lift that cup up and let the color flow. 
Now, wait a minute, where did that purple come from? Where did the green come from? Hey, wait a minute, we didn't add those colors in there. You saw what I added. There were no greens. There were no purples added. So where'd they come from? Those are all of the colors mixing and creating this look. That's the magic of the primary colors. Of course, you probably already knew that and it really wasn't magic to you, but dang, it's pretty when those colors mix together and create new ones. Yeah, you can tell I'm just a little addicted to color. I'm gonna add a little more paint in here just because I don't wanna leave any of that white space showing. So why did I speed up the camera? Well, that's because when you speed up the camera, you can really see how those cells spread apart thanks to good old gravity just pulling on them, stretching that color whichever way it wants to go. And what I'm doing right now is fiddling with the sides. The paint didn't completely cover all the sides and I love how it looks when that paint rolls over that. So I'm gonna help it along just using a palette knife and putting little bits of that paint there. Some of it straight from the jar and you can also scoop up any of the paint underneath that is dripped down so that it can be used to fill in the sides. And of course, don't forget about the sides you can't see very easily because I have been known once or twice to forget to check that fourth side. So happily this time, I actually remembered. I'm gonna leave it here on this metal rack for anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, basically letting it do most of its dripping here where it can be easily contained in that box. Now, that fancy rack that I'm using, that is simply a cooling rack that you get from the hard hardware store, grocery store, Walmart, whatever you go to, a kitchen cooling rack that's used when baking. Of course, once I've gotten all this paint on it, I'm never gonna use it for baking again. But this lets all the paint just drip down, and then after it's done dripping, then I'll move it to its long-term drying home. That would be a fancy drying rack made out of a couple of plastic cups glued to a piece of cardboard any way that you can put this so that it's level and that the sides aren't touching anything, that way it can completely dry, that's a drying rack. It doesn't have to be pretty, it doesn't have to be fancy, it just needs to be functional. Thanks so much for joining me for today's paint pouring play. If you'd like to see more of what I'm up to, head on over to my blog at acolorfuljourney.com. And of course, if you've been enjoying this video, you know I'd appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up. If you wanna see more of what I create, hit that subscribe button. That way you'll know as soon as I have a new video out. Thanks so much for letting me be a part of your colorful journey.